Father, that is our prayer, Lord, as we see uh, what feels like sometimes darkness invading and surrounding us. We pray, Lord, you would win this nation back for your glorious name. Jesus, you've been given all authority under heaven and er, on heaven and in, on earth and in heaven. Hopefully over my prayer, too. But we thank you, God. We thank you for your great power in the world today. We pray as we worship you together as the kingdom of God, the church of God, that you would be glorified in our hearts and magnified in our minds. And we pray that in Jesus' name. All God's people say. Amen. All right. Hey, find some people you don't know. There's a lot of people here. Go say hi to somebody.
All right. That's enough fellowship. That's enough fellowship for one day. Cut it. <laughs> if you guys want to, everybody make their way back to their seats and we'll do some announcements, do some more worshiping. It's uh, St. Patrick's Day, I guess, is what I'm told. I didn't wear any green, so please don't, please don't pinch. Um, so, <clears throat> just want to say welcome. Glad you guys are here with us another day um, in the house of the Lord. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. I guess everybody's pretty excited from that last song. I'm, I'm like, woo. <laughs> um, so, oh, all right. So, if there's any visitors with us, I know there is. Um, there's a little card in front of you. Uh, if you want, go ahead and fill that out, and um, you want to go take it through that door, and there's a little prayer box you can put it in, and that way we can reach out to you, make you feel welcome, um, or you don't have to, you know, it's your choice. <laughs> uh, I hope you feel welcome uh, regardless, so. Um, and then there's also a prayer, there's a prayer card next to the prayer box if you have any prayer requests as well. Um, so I just got these announcements this morning. So I'm probably just going to read them today. Let's see. Um, so women, uh, there's a, a new uh, biblical guidance program that's being offered now um, for, it's a spiritual mentoring program. So if you're going uh, through any life struggles, um, we have that now. And if you want any more information about that, contact Debbie Doubting. So is Debbie here? Oh, okay. Hi, Debbie. And she's got her green on. <laughs> so she's right there. If Yeah, if you're going through anything uh, and you want to sign up for that, um, you can contact her with any questions. Um, and then, so Friday, the 22nd, uh, there'll be a showing. It's the Great Passion Play, and that's from 6 to 8.30 p.m., so Friday, 22nd. So hopefully you guys have your pens out because there's a lot, and notepad, because there is a lot of info here. Um, so yeah, great passion play. And uh, let's see, Friday the 29th at 7, there, uh, that is the Good Friday service. So be there for that. Um, Sunday, 331 is the Easter sunrise service at 7 a.m. So have your coffee and come to that. It's a little too early for me. Okay, I'll be there, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, yes and amen. <laughs> Followed by breakfast and an Easter service at 10. So, okay. Everybody got all that? Yes. Passion play. It's here. It's here. Yep. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's a video? That's a video. Okay. Um, that's it. So enjoy the rest of the service, you guys. Oh, I guess there's some other people that have announcements too. All right. Thank you. Morning, church. How's everybody this morning? Would all of you consider yourself to be whosoever's? The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Zandra and I have put together a book called The Whosoever's, and it's based on the book of John, and it's going to be a Bible study where we come together, and we sit down at the table, and we discuss the book of John together one by one, and for the first couple of times, I'm going to be the facilitator, but after that, the goal is to have others lead the group in the discussion. Sounds like it's challenging, but in the book, we wrote how to do that. You could take that guidance, or you could lead how you feel fit. But the goal is we're going to start on April 9th, which is a Tuesday. We're going to have it here at 6.30. Is that right? No, 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock, 
and we're going to start jumping into who the whosoever it is. So if you've got questions like, what's an apostle? What's a disciple? Who is Jesus? How is he and the Father and the Holy Spirit one? John is the foundation for that, those questions, and it's going to give us an opportunity to dig on that stuff. So Tuesday, the 9th of April at 6.30. Thank you. Six. Six o'clock. Yes. Six. Here. 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 Yes. Also, a week from tonight, uh, Sunday the 24th, we are going to make a challenge to the church to show up and, like we just sang, want to see the church on fire. So there is a documentary out that some of you might have heard of, uh, put out by Eric Metaxas. Uh, he's the author of Bonhoeffer, and it's a 60-minute uh, documentary paralleling the German church and the American church. Really good information and good challenge, and we're going to show it here. We got approved to show it next Sunday night in place of at 6 p.m. Next Sunday night, child care will be available. And uh, so here is a 90-minute trailer. 90 seconds. 90 seconds. <laughs> 90 seconds. Let's just show the movie. <laughs> Is that okay? Okay, Jonathan, run it. I'm convinced that the American church has arrived at a significant moment of truth. We are only 75, 80 years removed from three separate regimes that killed 60 to 70 million people intentionally. The parallels with where the American church is now to where the German church stood in the face of the Nazi regime are unavoidable and grim. Churches need to understand really what Marxism is, which is to destroy the church, to destroy the word of God. So if you capture the seminaries, you capture the pastors, you capture the laity, you capture the soul of the world. Christianity is not just about saying Jesus loves you and then going to heaven one day, but that there's a war that's raging. The church is weakening, which is why Marxism is ascendant in America today. This is the hour of the American church. like this. <clears throat> um, this morning we have opportunity, uh, as you know, many times uh, over the history of Buell Bible Church, uh, we've had to face uh, health struggles. We have a brother uh, and his wife here in church who are uh, having to face a uh, battle with cancer. So um, I'm asking uh, Victor and Allison to come up we're going to have the discipleship guys, all the guys with the black shirts surround them to lay hands on them. And then anybody who'd like to come up, uh, we invite you as well. We're going to pray uh, that God would heal, grant wisdom and direction uh, to both uh, himself and Allison. So if you guys can come on up, we'll do that now. Somewhere. Nope, Mark's got a hand on him here. Mark's Mark. got a hand. <clears throat> Victor, I know you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Father God, we come before you and we lift up Victor and Allison, the whole family. 
because the whole family is going to endure this journey together. Lord, we pray first and foremost for your amazing healing power in his life. God, that you would deliver him, touch him, and heal him, Lord. In the upcoming days as they go through uh, the different testings and, and things that ha take place through doctors and hospitals, Lord, we ask that you would uh, just give him incredible strength, incredible peace. We pray for Allison, Lord, that she would feel your presence and... And God, the entire family would know that, uh, that they are not alone, Lord. You walk with them. Their brothers and sisters who love them are here praying and uh, lifting them up, Lord Jesus, that you would do a perfect work in and through them, Lord. We pray for deliverance. We pray for wisdom. When crossroads appear, when there's decisions to be made, we pray that you would direct them, that you would lead them, that you would show them the, the route to walk. And, uh, Lord, as, as we do so, we, we hear, God, your scripture in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 saying, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yesterday, we had a marriage conference here, and it was such a blessing. It was so spirit-filled. <clears throat> and um, yesterday morning, the Lord had put it on my heart to sing a song called Better Hands. Uh, and we sang it twice yesterday, and it seemed to just flow right into our marriages. And, uh, you know, one, things we were, one of the things we were talking about yesterday, though, though the state may recognize our marriage, it's God who ordains our marriage. And one of the things that was said yesterday by uh, Pastor Rich was, every single one of you have an ordained marriage. God has brought you together. And so I added this song last night at about 8 o'clock. The worship team loves when I do that. But I think it's for more than that. 
I believe that this song can bless Victor and his family, but also bless anybody going through anything that needs to be reminded that these things are in better hands. So let's sing this together. ahead of myself I want to go my own way Cause when I go my own way I always fall short I'm Learning how to let it go I'm Learning how to trust you Cause every time I trust you I'm never more sure This is in better hands this is a better plan This is in better hands than my own This is in better hands This is a better plan This is in better hands than my own Don't want to build my house on sand Don't want to build my home Cause there's only one name worthy of all I'm learning how to let it go I'm learning how to trust you Cause every time I trust you I'm never more sure This is in better hands This is a better place this is in better hands than my own. This is in better hands. This is a better place. This is in better hands than my own. You saved me when I could not save myself. You love me more than Trying to let it go I'm learning how to trust you Cause every time I trust you I'm never more sure Come on This is in better hands This is a better plan This is in better hands than my own This is in better hands this is a better plan. This is in better hands than my own. This is in better hands. Yes, it is. This is a better plan. Always is. Thank you, Lord. This is in better hands than my own. It's in better hands. Right now. Let's lift our hands. This is in better hands. This is in better plan. This is in better hands than my own. Just the voices. This is in better hands. This is a better plan. This is in better hands than my own. Thank you, Lord, that all of our life that you've given us is in your hands. We thank you, Lord. Just be glorified as we continue to sing and inhabit these praises. Lord, open our eyes and ears up to your presence here with us this morning. 
pray that in Jesus' name. promises time and time again you have proven you'll do just what you say though the storms may come and the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast and then my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting, same I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. God, from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness. Great 
is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same i will praise your name great is your faithfulness to lift our voices to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that while we were still sinners Christ died for us and will not withhold any good thing from us to him who sits on the throne and unto the land to him sits on the throne and unto the land sing that again to him who sits on the throne and unto the land to him who sits on the throne to the land to him who sits on the throne and unto the land to him to him who sits on the throne and unto the land lift your voices be blessing and glory and honor and power forever. Be blessing and glory and honor and power forever. Sing that again. Be blessing and glory.
Father, our prayer this morning, that we would be filled with your spirit, that your spirit would bring healing, would bring hope, would bring peace, would bring all gentleness and kindness into our lives, that you would bring all trust and faith and hope in you. God, we're desperate for you people cry out, come Lord Jesus, save us, God. We thank you, Lord, for every good and perfect gift that you've given us. And we ask, Lord, as we, as we transition the part of worship towards a testimony and then in the, into the reading of the scriptures and the teaching and preaching of the word, Lord, that the worship would continue. That in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. This morning, uh Eric LeDuc's going to share his evangelistic testimony with us. Well, I'll try not to look at the crowd so I don't get too nervous. Um, first, I want to thank everyone here. It has been an absolute blessing to be welcomed into this community and this congregation. Um, truly, you can see the love of Christ in those that love him. And that is something that until very recently was sorely missing from my life. The person I am now is nothing like who I was. And I want to disabuse you first of any notion that I was a good or kind person in most of my life. It, who I am now is thanks to Jesus Christ. So... Basically, from the end of my childhood, from the end of the, our period of innocence and grace, uh, I have lived in a state of constant, pervasive despair, of emptiness, of nothingness. There was a void in my heart that now I understand that's where God was meant to be in all of us. But he was not there for me. Um, whatever excuses my upbringing, our education system, my own pride and arrogance, God was missing in my life. And so everything that I felt, everything that I was, drained away into a void of pointlessness. It was numbed, might be a close word, but that doesn't convey an absence of everything, of all feeling, of all emotion, love, kindness, tenderness, even hate, drained away. It was the feeling of being a puppet of flesh, and there was no soul there. And it was, I felt the antithesis of existence would be how I'd say that. And so, of course, I tried to fill the void with, you know, healthy things at first, friends, activities, scholastic achievements, pointless, empty. Um, in desperation, I turned towards other measures, uh, cigarettes, drugs, women, self-harm, willfully enacting evil because goodness didn't work. And 
you get moments of cheap thrills, the chemicals go through and then they leave and you're left just as empty as before. Uh, I sinned desperately, creatively, and constantly. I cared absolutely nothing for others, but I cared even less than nothing for myself. I actively hated everything in the world, and I did my best to spread that hate because I wanted people to feel as I did. I squandered every opportunity I was presented with absolute masochistic glee, and I fully expected to die before I was 20. When that didn't happen, I became a little bit more proactive on that front. I turned towards harder drugs, and I turned towards thoughts of suicide. Um, constantly, every day, in every moment, every turn in the road was an opportunity to see how well the truck would fly. Every evening, I got to know the taste of gun oil as well as cooking oil, debating whether a half pound of pressure would end um, not even the pain, but my emptiness. And each time there's a little voice in my head that said, not today, not like this. And I don't know why I listened. I didn't know who it was. And for some reason, God decided to keep me around. Later in my life, I found my wife, who I was blessed beyond measure to have somebody that loved a wretch like me, as some of you might remember from our renewal of vows. I promise I sing better in the truck. <laughs> and, um, and she loved me, and she comforted me to an extent. The empty pit inside my soul had a bridge built over it, but it was still there, knocking away at the nights as I was alone, even though we were together. As our years went on, Caitlin found faith and dragged me into it like the obliging husband that said, yes, dear, and propped up the dusty Bible on the shelf and didn't really believe. I played at lip service through ceremonies. I sang without my heart in it, and it was a performance. I had not given myself over to Christ. I was still bound by pride, arrogance, and mostly despair that everything was fruitless. I did have something of a change of heart before then, and accepted the idea of that a God could exist, that souls exist, when my first daughter, Catherine, was conceived. Not born, but at the moment of conception, we could feel her soul descend into the world, into the womb between us, where there was two, there was three now. And if any of you have met her, she was the same fiery sunburst of love, passion, and contrariness that we felt that night that she's been to this day. And so... That, that changed my worldview on a lot of things. And over time, I began to pray somewhat in earnest, but never for myself. I would pray for others. I'd pray for the nation. I would pray against people, but I did not pray for my own salvation because a willful sinner such as I deserved only to burn. It was not right. It was not fair that after all my life as I had lived, that I would be saved. And again, my pride. And as many of men will know, our wives don't let us keep much of that pride through our lives. And she kept working at me and kept asking me, when are you going to pray for yourself? And, you know, just brush it off, but it's still there and she's still working at me. Until finally one evening just a bit over a year ago. I was in the middle of the southern Idaho desert, no, no other humans in sight, yeah, parked in a truck, and I just bent myself over the, peer, the steering wheel, and I cried, and I prayed to God. I gave up the fight, and I said, save me. And God answered, and he did save me. And in that incredible moment, the pit was gone. I, it, it was a transformation because who I was died at that moment because I was filled. And I've never 
experienced anything like that, and I don't expect to experience that again until I leave this earth. But God has a house in each of our hearts, and we just have to open the door, and when we finally do, he is there, patient and eternal. And if we will, if we'll only let his spirit in, it doesn't matter how much we've sinned before, it doesn't matter what we have done, we are still his children, and he wants to save us. And I was filled with his grace and his spirit, and I knew something I had never felt before, and that was peace, contentment. The, I no longer felt myself draining away into pointlessness. I knew the fullness of life like I was a child again, that the innocence had come back, though, by knowledge and will and faith. And I can never undo who I was, the choices I've made, and where I've been, but it does not define me. It is an experience through which my faith now is honed forever in Jesus Christ who saved me and who redeemed me and made me anew. The wickedness and anguish that once failed me no longer rules my life, and I cannot repay those I've harmed and I cannot repay what God has given freely to me. It is still my joy to be a man who honors God's word and brings kindness rather than pain to those who endure my company because I'm still difficult. <laughs> and I was, I was a lost wretch until he found me and the blind brought me to see and I can never ever describe how great his grace was the hour I first believed. Thank you. It was a beautiful testimony. Um, I got to I got to hear that um, beforehand, and uh, it's still amazing every time when when you see the work that God does that God does through somebody, right? Um, so now you have about five seconds to get to Galatians chapter four. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Done. Good job. <laughs> Galatians chapter four. I'm going to read out of the ESV. You're welcome, Jared. All right. It says, brothers, starting at verse 12, brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, for I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. You know it was because of a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus. What then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your eyes and given them to me. Have I then become your enemy by telling you the truth? They make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. It is always good to be made much for a good purpose. And not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone, for I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically, these women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are, are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a, a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just 
as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also is, na- is it, it is now. But what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So brothers, we are not, of the, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. And then 5.1, for freedom in Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for another day was a promise to us, Lord. We thank you for your grace, your mercy on the work that you are doing in this body, Lord Father. And we um, cannot thank you enough, Lord God. And we pray that as we open up your word and study it, Lord, uh, we, we ask for your wisdom. We ask for your discernment. Um, and that your spirit would continue to transform our minds by your word, Lord, by your truth and love, and um, your will be done, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. And children are dismissed. I didn't forget. (laughs) (laughs) Let me... uh, before we jump in, give you guys a quick update. I just got a text from Destiny and Tommy in the hospital. For those of you who <clears throat> are not aware, baby Judah has been in the hospital about seven days. Uh, they've been fighting. He has pneumonia. They've been fighting getting his oxygen levels to an appropriate place. Um, last night, they started doing some alternative treatments. Uh, here's a message this morning. Judah had a great night last night. <clears throat> this morning, we've been able to wean him down from 12 liters to 10 on the Vapo Therm, and his respirations have been great since weaning this morning. We will probably wean him again soon. Please continue to pray for his breathing and respirations to be within normal ranges. Thank you all for your prayers. They are our greatest weapon. So uh, let's pray for baby Judah real quick, and we'll jump in. Father God, we, uh, we lift up little Judah to you. Lord, we pray for Destiny and Tommy <clears throat> in the hospital. Lord, we pray, God, that your hand will be upon them. We ask even now as they are weaning little Judah down uh, two more liters, Lord, we pray, God, that he would continue uh, to breathe normally, Lord, that you would fill his little lungs with all the oxygen that he needs. And in and through it all, God, we pray you be glorified As you touch his body, we look forward to the day when mom and dad are able to bring little Judah home. So we lift him to you and ask your blessing on him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are going to finish chapter 4 of Galatians all before lunch. Hold fast. As we do, I just want to remind you the... The division of the book of Galatians, we did the first two chapters, which are a summary um, of the gospel of the crucified Christ. Uh, then chapters three and four are the, uh, the result, what the gospel does. It brings people from every tribe, nation, and tongue into one family under Christ. And so we see the, the multi-ethnic family of Jesus and of Abraham And then finally, chapters 5 and 6 are going to show us uh, how the gospel transforms people by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. So this is where we are. In chapter 12, there's a a few things, or not chapter, chapter 4, verse 12. Yeah, you'll never find chapter 12. Good luck. In verse 12, there is a series of verses here that in the English I would call a little clunky. Because you're going to read them and you're going to, you may scratch your head a little bit and ask yourself, now what exactly is going on here? This is one of those times where perhaps you've heard me encourage folks when you study the Bible to read multiple translations because it will help you see where we have translational issues that we don't have straight across English words for the Greek words or terms or We don't have a figure of speech like they do, and this is one of those situations. We're going to see it here as we begin. He says, brothers, I entreat you, become as I am, 
for I also have become as you are, and you did me no wrong. Now what Paul is saying to them in verse 12 is, hey, you and me were true friends. Now, I don't know if you would catch that out of that text. The reason you wouldn't is because there's a Greek idiom that insists that friends must be together. You see a similar thing in Ecclesiastes. Uh, Can two walk together unless they agree? The idea here in the Greek is, um, I'm begging you that you and I would see this the same way. The you and I would be the same here. You would become as me, even as I have become as you. He's making a declaration that they would see this issue, the issue of whether or not you need to add the adherence to the old covenant, in particular circumcision, in order to be a real Christian, a true Christian. Will you need to become Jewish. And then he says, there's, there's, you've done me no wrong. What's he saying? He's saying, listen, I want you to recognize that God does not require circumcision for your identity in Christ. He does not require circumcision so that you can be spiritually mature. But if you take this yoke on that these other teachers are telling you, then you are not like me. So he's giving a declaration here between true friends and false friends. You guys ever recognize the difference in those things? And he's saying, true friends, we're going to see this alike. This was an area for Paul that you can't agree to disagree. This is an area for Paul where you have a different gospel. Remember, he told us already earlier in the book of Galatians, look, if anybody comes to you and teach any other gospel than what I've showed you, let him be anathema. Let him be accursed. This, was a, this is a major, not a minor. This is a, a major deal that he is laying out for them. So he's asking them, you started as my true friends. You saw things the way I taught them to you. Now these guys have shown up and we're separated, right? Paul, Paul's not sitting there right in front of them. So he's at a disadvantage, but he's asking them, remember, be as I was and, and don't, do no wrong. Follow in the teachings that were laid out. He says in verse 13, for you know it was because of a body ailment, a bodily ailment that I preached the gospel to you at first. And though my condition was a trial to you, you did not scorn or despise me, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So despite the struggles when he first came, he was weak, he was sick, there were struggles, there were issues. He said, but you welcomed me despite all that condition. And so when he arrived, remember, he bears in his body the marks of the persecution that he was facing. Had he faced persecution when he went to Galatia? Remember, he was stoned and left for dead. You have those issues that were a part of what Paul was doing. So he bears the marks of the beatings, of the stonings in his health, and that yet they received him. They didn't go, well, if God really loves you, you would never be sick. Have you guys ever heard those ideas? If God really loves you, you'd never struggle, you'd never face hard things, you'd never go. But that wasn't Paul's reality, was it? So in Paul's reality, he's saying, look, you guys received me. You welcomed me despite that. Verse 15, what then has become of your blessedness? For I testify to you that if possible, you would have gouged out your own eyes and given them to me. Now, a lot of people will take this text and they'll say, well, see, then the, the problem that Paul was facing was an issue with his eyes. And that may be. But what they're sharing is a figure of speech like when we say, I, I would give you my right arm. I, I care so much about you. I would, I would give you this or I would give you that. It's the same idea. Look, you would even give me your eyes. Paul's saying when we were first doing this ministry together, you would have, this is how true our friendship was, how close our bond was. Why now do you want to abandon this uh, and put your focus on another. He wraps it up in verse 16. 
Have I then become your enemy for telling you the truth? Have I become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth? Three other times in the book of Galatians, Paul has talked about this idea. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 5, he says to them, We did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So Paul's saying, look, are, are we losing this relationship because I'm saying this thing that we're talking about, this issue, this focus is a matter of the gospel and it can't be something that we turn our back on. Are you going to abandon the truth for some other gospel? This is their struggle, Galatians 2.14. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. This is when Paul confronts Peter about his behavior because he was not walking the truth of the gospel. This was not a, you know, we just have decided to see this differently. You think that we should have drums in worship and I think that there should be no instruments. This is not that issue. This is an issue of the gospel. You're changing the gospel. And that's why Paul's focus is on it. In Galatians chapter 5, we'll be there next week. He says, you were running well. You were doing good. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Now here in chapter 4, as we saw in verse 16, he says, am I your enemy? Because I'm telling you the truth of the gospel. You are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. Circumcision does not add anything to it. You are saved by faith in Christ alone. Adherence to the old covenant does not make you closer or more mature in your relationship with Christ. You are saved by grace alone, faith in Christ Jesus. This is the salvation that we have. And so Paul is saying, look, when we started, I was your true friend. We were, we were linked together. But now through the teaching of these other men, that, that link is being tested. If you go in this direction, you are abandoning the truth. You see, the pushers of circumcision were naming Paul as the enemy because he stood against their practice. And Paul is telling those in Galatia, if you go this way, because I've been truthful with you about the gospel, will we then be found enemies? He goes on now to focus on the false zeal of the other teachers and the true concern that Paul has for them. Let's look at verse 17. Uh, they make much of you, but for no good purpose. They want to shut you out that you may make much of them. Now, again, as we even saw earlier in the ESV, you may say, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. In the New English translation, it says this, they court you eagerly, but for no good purpose. They want to exclude you so that you would seek them eagerly. The New King James says it like this, they zealously court you, but for no good, yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. The point that he's making is the ultimate aim of the agitators was so that they could make disciples for themselves. Not so that these men and women disciples would be disciples of Jesus Christ. Right? When we come to the Great Commission, it says all authority is given to who? Jesus, right? Jesus said all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of every nation. What are they disciples of? Disciples of Jackie? Disciples of Victor? Disciples of Jordan? Disciples of Mark? No, who are they disciples of? Jesus Christ. And what Paul is saying is these guys, they're zealous for you. They're eager for you. They want to make much of you, but it's not for a good purpose. It's so that you would respond to follow them. And Paul is going to say, follow me as I follow Christ. The focus is and needs to be always on Jesus Christ. 
So Paul here is portraying his rivals like they're courting the Galatians. They're after them. They're in rivalry for their affection. They, as false friends of the gospel, are trying to make the Galatians follow them. Follow them and go their way. Look what he says in verse 18. It is always good to be made much of for a good purpose, and not only when I am present with you. Again, in the English, it's a little clunky to me. But as we look at the other translations in the NET, however, it is good to be sought eagerly for, for good purpose at all times, and not only when I am with you. Galatians uh, 4.18 in the New King James, it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am with you. He's saying this idea, this pursuit, it's not just, have you guys ever known chameleons? Like a chameleon is that kind of friend that just takes on what's necessary when he's with you. Like I got to look like this with you. And then over there, I'm going to look like that. And over there, I'm going to look like that. A chameleon. Paul is saying, look, it's good if they're zealous for you. If they want to help you grow and they help you and want to help you learn. But Paul's point is, I'm not there with you. And because I'm not there with you now, are you, are, are you going to abandon the gospel to go this other way? Will you now put yourself under the old covenant? Does the old covenant still have sway under the new covenant? <clears throat> the, according to the book of Hebrews, the old covenant has been done away with. By a greater than Moses. You ever heard that phrase? Or a greater than the angels or greater than Abraham, or greater than Solomon. Who is this? Who is the greater than all of those things? Yes, that's right. It's Jesus. Jesus. Because of better promises, a better covenant. So this is the challenge that he's laying out for them. He's saying the intentions of those teachers that are there now are dishonorable. They're not like Paul's. He's saying his intentions are honorable. Even though they're separated by space, he wants them to be built up. He wants them to grow in the grace of Jesus Christ. He wants them to be able to walk in that freedom, to be able to experience all that the new covenant promised them as believers. And so this is what he's trying to express to them. In verse 19, he says, So my little children... For whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Every man, every Paul over his Timothy, every human being who has ever mentored another or <clears throat> tried to encourage another and in one way or another been a part of discipling another human being has an incredible desire to see Christ in that person. That's why when we share our testimony, even as, as Eric did today, and we share our testimony, part of that is our transformation. The point is what happens when Christ enters into my life? I'm not just saved. I'm being transformed so that you can see Christ in me, so that I can see Christ in you. And so Paul is saying, look, I am like a woman that is giving birth. I'm in, I'm in the pains of childbirth longing to see you show the colors of Christ in your life. That's a desire of every, every person who has ever taught anyone else anything out of the word. Not to think, not to see their name in, in headlights, not to see a billboard with their picture on it or their face on it, but to see men and women reflecting the love of Christ as they've come to know Christ through the efforts of the teaching. It's the greatest joy we can see. Paul talks about it in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Listen to what he says. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but what? 
be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you, uh, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. By not seeing Christ reflected in somebody's life, their life not like the world anymore, but being transformed into the image of Christ so that you see Christ in them. Man, that's glorious. 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul writes this, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. That's the image of Christ coming through believers, right? We're all becoming like Jesus. That's the goal. Don't be like me. Be like Jesus. We want to become like Jesus. All of us, that's our goal that Christ would be seen in you. So we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. We all in the same place at the same time? No, but are we all on the journey? Yes. This is the point. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. This is gonna be Paul's focus as we shift from chapter four into chapter five to learn to walk in the power of the spirit and experience the transformation that God gives us as a result. Now he goes on in verse 20 of Galatians chapter four and he says, I wish I could be there now. I wish I could be present with you and change my tone, right? He's writing a letter, you know, it's even slower than texting. This is how I know my texting is going too slow. Jordan will send me a text that says, nice talk. (laughs) So when I see nice talk pop up on my phone, I realize there's been a question or something that I've missed. (laughs) So I'll either get a text that says, nice talk or okay boomer or something like that. that helps me know something's been missed. Now, the way they were conducting this conversation is not via text or phone. I mean, you think snail mail is slow. What do you think mail was like back then? Paul's writing a letter, handing it to a dude who's going to get on a horse and and write it to Galatia. Man, this is going to take a long time. So he's saying to them, man, I wish I was there with you. I wish I was right there and I, and, I, and, I, and, and I could just see in your face that you're hearing what I'm saying and I, I wouldn't have to worry about my tone. I would know, oh yes, you, you understand, you see, you're, you're feeling my heart and the emotion of my desire to see you. But now he can only say, for I am perplexed. I don't understand. He's already said, who bewitched you? Now, we talked a little bit about this last time when we talked about the picture of a new exodus, right? You remember that Jesus, like a new exodus, has set us free, not from enslavement to Egypt, but from our bondage to sin, amen? And once you've been set free from your bondage to sin, why on earth would you say, I wanna go back to slavery? So Paul is saying, I don't understand why, why you want to do this? Why would you go back to Egypt? We've, we've read that, right? As we've gone through our one-year Bible, we've been working our way through it. Um, um, we've, we've actually already done it. We're in the, in the middle of numbers right now. But as we look at it, as we see, we are recognized. Why would you want to go back to Egypt? You think you're safe and secure back there. All the old trappings for the Jewish believer in Jesus Christ, their struggle, and the whole purpose behind the book of Hebrews is they had a struggle, a cultural struggle, to go back to what they knew. And and it was difficult for them to hear the words of Paul, who is also a cultural Jew, right? Who is saying to them, the old covenant's gone. It's passed away. Jesus Christ, the promised one, the one we've been waiting for has come. And now we can be set free. And rather than being under the trapping of the law and our failure of the law, he's saying now we can walk in the power of the spirit and be the men and women that God's calling us to be. Victory is expected. Victory is expected. 
It's not. The question we always ask ourselves is, well, why do I still sin? Well, you're still here. But you're not defeated by sin ever. Never. Sin's, the last word of sin is done. It has no last word. Jesus Christ is the last word now. And he said, it is finished. You are delivered. Now walk in the spirit. That's the message of Galatians chapter 5. And this is what Paul's saying. I don't, I, I don't understand. I'm perplexed. So he's going to give them one more example as we close out today. One more example. Two women, two families, two covenants, two mountains, too confusing to understand all the things I'm going to try to point to you. And I've I wrestled with how do I do this without... Um, sometimes I get home after a Sunday and I, I look at Kathy and I say, hey, babe, how'd that go? And she goes, well, to be honest, I'm still confused. <laughs> and then I go, well... That was, that was a failure. I have to try harder. So this time, as I'm looking at this, this there's like an illustration that Paul's going to develop between Sarah and Hagar and the child of promise and the child of the flesh. And so there's a lot of different things. So I tried to make a chart. We got a chart? Blue. So I don't know if you guys can see it. Get really close to the TV. But I'm just going to have them leave this up there. And as we get from the verses... Uh, we'll just put the next one up because there's it, the, yeah, there's three slides going to develop. You're actually going to have to use your Bibles, but praise God, we all have them, right? So we're going to follow along in the Bible to so see this illustration. So Paul's saying, you've perplexed me. I'm going to give one final illustration before I challenge you all to walk in the spirit. So here's what he's going to say in verse 21. He says, tell me you who desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, one by the free. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according to the promise. So as he's building this introduction, he's seeking to show uh, the Gentile converts, the believers there in Galatia, and those who are struggling with wanting to go back under the law, that they don't really understand what the law teaches. So he's going to make a comparison. And the idea is that the law is a function of the flesh. So as we move forward and we say, what are the things that I want to do? Do we want to be expressing our lives through the flesh? That's not a trick question. What's in your gut is probably right. No, we don't walk according to the flesh. We walk according to the spirit. So we, want, we don't want to walk according to the flesh. So he's going to say this example of the old covenant is an example of the woman who had a child by the flesh. And he's going to compare it to Ishmael. Now, this is going to me mess with your brain because you're going to say, Ishmael, no, 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 no. Isaac's the son of promise. Yes, you're right. Paul's going to use the illustration of Isaac to point to the new covenant, the grace that came through Jesus Christ. So he's developing this idea, this view. He wants them to see both of these sons were circumcised. Both of these sons were under their father Abraham. Both were by flesh children of Abraham, but both were not children of promise. One is an example of the flesh, the other an example of the spirit. This is what he wants us to understand. Now, the other teachers, those false teachers in Galatia, they're teaching them, in order to become true descendants of Abraham, you need to go back to circumcision. And Paul's saying, no, that's a work of the flesh. We need to walk in the strength of the spirit. And so he's developing this illustration. Hopefully, I won't totally lose you as I try to walk you through it. Now, verse 24, now this may be interpreted allegorically. So he's saying, I'm making an illustration where different things relate to different things. And so we have some parallels, I think, up on the board. For example, for example, that's not a word. <laughs> for example, the earlier covenant, the old covenant, is, the, is exampled in this story as, by the slave woman. That's Hagar. And the new covenant that's exampled as the free woman or Sarah. 
So he's, he's saying, where do we want to be? One is following the example of Mount Sinai. We see the picture to the law, right? That's where the law was given, Mount Sinai. The other is the mountain, Mount Zion. He's going to call the New Jerusalem. The new, where's the New Jerusalem at? Well, it's not here yet, but it's going to be, right? There's going to be a New Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth, right? A heavenly Jerusalem, you could say. And so he's developing this idea, maybe interpreted allegorically. So the two women are two covenants, the old covenant and the new covenant. They are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai. Which one's that? That's the old covenant. And that covenant only, listen, only, listen, only bears children to slavery. That's going back to slavery, not going toward Christ. That woman, Mount Sinai, she is Hagar. Paul says in verse 24, she's the old covenant and she only develops or gives birth to children who are slaves, not free. So then he goes on. Verse 25. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to this present Jerusalem. Which Jerusalem? The one that was there when Paul was around, right? So he's saying this Jerusalem, this culture, this world is all part of slavery to sin. Because unless you come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, you are separated from God by your sin no matter where you were born. You are all slaves of sin apart from Christ. Does everybody understand? Our natural state as men and women apart from, apart from Christ is slaves to sin, separated from God, but God, right? The whole point of but God, but God, he reached out to us. Through Jesus Christ, he helps us enter in. He helps us recognize he helps us to understand so hagar corresponds to this present jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children he wants them to understand this present jerusalem the place where jesus met his death the place where the chief priests and the pharisees hold official and unofficial sway the place from which certain emissaries have come to Galatia in order to teach a rival teaching to Paul's. This place is in slavery with her children. The culture does not save you. Now, how would we translate that today? Well, some people in the United States think if you're an American, you're Christian. Sorry, that's not how that works. If you are a follower of Christ, you have repented of your sinful life and come in faith to Christ as your Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved has nothing to do with where you were born. Here's another little news flash. It has nothing to do with your mom and dad. If your mom and dad are saved, hallelujah for your mom and dad. That doesn't save the children. If your grandma and grandpa are saved, hallelujah for your grandma and grandpa. It doesn't save grandchildren. God only has children. Not grandchildren, not great-grandchildren, not great-great-grandchildren. You have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You have to turn from your sin and turn to Jesus. And when you do, he sets you free from your slavery to sin. And then the point of emphasis is now we don't go back. We don't go back to slavery and sin. We move forward walking in the spirit with Jesus Christ. This is the point that is, he is building on and wants us to recognize and wants us to see. 
Here's the contrast. Look at verse 26. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Now he's thinking of Sarah. He'll bring that out in a moment. Now he's thinking of Sarah. Now he's pointing to the heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, which the book of Revelation tells us who lives there. All the believers live there. All, what, only certain believers? Is it only Jewish believers? Is it only Arabian believers? Is it only Mexican believers? No, it's all believers from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Right? All gathered in one place, the new Jerusalem. So he's saying that place, the new Jerusalem, Jerusalem above, that's free, not slavery. Jerusalem above, she's our mother. Paul is saying, that's my mom. Notice he's not pointing to the temple. Notice he's not pointing to the Jerusalem that is the day Paul's standing there. He's saying, oh, no, that's, not, that's not my home. The new Jerusalem is my home. My home is in Christ Jesus. Didn't he already say in Galatians 2.20 how his identity is in Christ? I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith, where? In the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, right? I'm, I am his. This is the declaration that he's making. The Jerusalem above is free. Paul's saying he's got his eyes set on a different Jerusalem, However great the Sinai or present Jerusalem might appear, they cannot compare to a city whose builder and maker is God. This is the place where our eyes should be focused. Isaiah 65, Isaiah 65, verse 17 and 18, listen, says, for behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth. We've heard that before, right? Where have we heard that before in the New Testament? Book of Revelation for sure, right? So he's saying, look, this is not a, this is not a new idea. God, this is not plan B. All the way back with Isaiah, the Lord said, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered, nor come to mind. The old ways, they go, and the new ways, they stand. The former things won't be remembered. <clears throat> he goes on to say, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. In that which I, have, I am creating. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy. Now what Jerusalem is Isaiah talking about? He's not talking about the one they rebuilt. What's he talking about? He's talking about new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. Yeah, there will be, what, what kind of joy will there be that day? What do you think it's gonna look like the day we walk into the new Jerusalem together? All the battle's over, the battle with sin is done. Jesus Christ has delivered everything and everyone. We're in a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. You think that's gonna be a bad day? You think there might be joy? Are we still gonna be struggling with the, with the difficult things of this life? Of, of battling with cancer or illness or babies in hospitals? Are we going to still be struggling in those ways? No. No, we'll be set free. Amen? You think on that day you're going to go, but Lord, I'd sure like to go back to Egypt. <laughs> Do you think that's even going to be in your head? This is why Paul's perplexed. Why do you want to go back? What Christ has wrought for you is so much better. We don't move backwards, we move forward. Look at verse 27. For it is written, rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Now that should sound familiar as well. If you're a Bible student, you'll realize that's a quotation from Isaiah. It's a quotation from Isaiah, and Paul is putting that quotation and saying Sarah is a fulfillment of that quotation. And from the seed of Abraham, how many people are going to be saved? How many nations will be blessed through the covenant to Abraham? All the nations of the world. All of them? All of them. All of them. Because what's Christ going to do? He's going to invite them all into covenant relationship with him. 
Come to me, you. Yeah, you guys have heard it before. It's outside on the wall, right? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is, the, this is what Christ has come to do. This is why we keep our eyes focused on him. Listen to the quotation. O barren one who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud, you who are in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the one who has a husband. Now, Paul is applying that to Sarah and the children that are going to come to her through the seed of Abraham, which is Jesus Christ. And he's saying, Sarah, you didn't have a lot of kids, right? How many children did Sarah have? One. What's his name? Isaac. What would they call him Isaac for? Laughter, right? Laughter, joy. Oh, interesting, no? And so he's saying, There's gonna, you're going to have more children than you can even imagine. When you read in Revelation chapter 7 and you see the, the fruit of, of the 144,000, what do you see? An innumerable host from every tribe, nation, and tongue that cannot be counted. And I am telling you, those are all Sarah's kids. They're children of Abraham. And Paul is saying here, he's saying, man, you're going to sing, barren one, because life here was a drag. And there were struggles and things we had to endure. But you persevered. And now the children of the desolate one will be way more, way more. Sarah's going to have more kids than Hagar. Paul is saying Sarah here is the one who is desolate. And her family will be from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Isaiah 51.2 says this. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you. For he was but one when I called him that I might bless him and multiply him. And how many is he now? You guys remember the song, right? Father Abraham. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just play. Yeah, look at you guys. You got it. So, <clears throat> so we are of the family. Now, do we have to be circumcised to be part of that family? No. No, that's what Paul's saying. Look at verse 28. Now you brothers, now he's going to look at the children. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. He's talking to the Galatians. He's talking to Gentiles. He says, you are children of promise. He's telling them, you are the children of promise of Romans 9. You are the children of promise who have come by faith in Christ into the family of God. He is saying, now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise, but just as at that time, he who was according to the flesh, that's the other family, right? Those other teachers that are there trying to bring them back into slavery, he says, they are children of the flesh. And what did, what did Ishmael do to Isaac? The Old Testament tells us that he persecuted him. He picked on him. He's like, you know, look, Isaac, I know, I know, you're that promise, but I was first. Neener, neener, neener. <laughs> they're just kids. That's what kids do, no? And so they're, the point that Paul's making is the sons of the flesh are always going to pick on the children of promise. They're always going to pick on them because they're going to say, you haven't done it right. You got to do it this way. This is how you enter into the family of God. But we know that we enter into the family of God by faith in Christ Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. So he says, just as at that time, he who was according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so it is now. This is how it is now. This is what you're experiencing with those other teachers. Now listen to what he's going to tell them to do. But what does the scripture say? The scripture said, cast out the slave woman and her son. Now, what do you think the message is to the Galatians? You get rid of those teachers. Get rid of them. They are not, that's a different gospel. That's a different teaching. That's a different direction. 
They've got to go. Cut them out. Cast them out like the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not inherit with the son of the free. You cannot, flesh and blood, your flesh, your works of the flesh, cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Not ever, not even a little bit, not even some. The works of your flesh cannot. It is by faith in the finished work of Christ, which he has accomplished and not we ourselves. He has done it. And we put our faith and trust in him. And then our efforts are to walk in the spirit so that Christ would be evident in my life. You will see Christ through me as I walk in the spirit following Jesus. And it's not about the thou shalt this and thou shalt that. <coughs> it is about putting your eyes on Christ Jesus and moving forward. Not looking back. And this is what he's declaring to them. So he says, so brothers, we are not of the slave. We are of the promise. We are of the free. We're sons of Abraham. Who are sons of Abraham? Everyone who has faith in Christ. What if they're Yugoslavian? Well, they're still a son of Abraham, right? Oh, it's not Yugoslavia anymore. What if they're Serbian? There, it doesn't matter, right? Because if they have faith in Christ, they're a son of Abraham. They're part of the family of God. Now, we are not children of the slave, but children of the free. So Paul's saying, don't let anyone take your inheritance. Don't let someone come up to you and say, you're not a real child. You don't get the inheritance unless you do A, B, C, D. He said, no, don't let them take your inheritance for you are already true children of the first fruits of the blessing of Abraham. And you know that because you have the spirit with you. It's the Holy Spirit that is the guarantee, not circumcision or some other procedure. It is what Christ has provided. So then listen to the proclamation of of chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. What is the command? Stand firm in your freedom. Is it go back to Egypt? Is it go back to slavery? Is it go back to anything? Or stand where you are in Christ. Stand firm, therefore, and do not take upon yourself the yoke of slavery again. Paul's saying Christ has liberated us from our sin and from the need for external rules. And this transformation was not done by self-discipline. This transformation isn't something you did to yourself. It's something the indwelling spirit of God has done in you. It is his work. It is his provision. Two scriptures and then we're going to pray. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We'll get there next week. But the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the spirit. That's where we walk. That's where we live. Romans 14, 17 says this. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is where the kingdom of God is. Paul's point is simply this. Israel, according to the flesh, is still in exile. Whether she has her own land or not, she is still enslaved to sin. She is still unredeemed and awaiting redemption, which can only come by faith in Christ Jesus. So if you have faith in Christ Jesus, you are redeemed. You are right where you need to be. 
Stand therefore and do not take upon yourself the yoke of slavery again. Amen? Amen. Why don't you guys stand with me? We made it. Man, it's, I know you could have had lunch 15 minutes ago, but you can still have lunch in 15 minutes. So that's the good news. Uh, let's do our doxology and then we'll pray together. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to study your word. We thank you that we can gather for worship. We can gather and hear the words of testimony. We can gather and pray. We thank you, Lord, that as we open your word and study your word, your scripture <coughs> is changing us from the inside out. The work of the spirit is happening. You are sanctifying your body, Lord. We trust you and we hope in you for that. But as we gather and as we come before you, we can acknowledge that there may be those here today who don't know you, who are still enslaved to sin. And God, we pray that even now your spirit would be calling, beckoning, even as Eric shared, it can happen in the middle of the desert. It can happen while you're sitting in your truck or sitting in your living room. The spirit of the Lord God Almighty beckons you, come. So Lord, we just pray if there's anybody here today for whom that is happening, that they would come forward as we have elders and deacons and folks available up front to pray with you. They would love to pray with you and, and uh, um, bring you into the presence of the Lord God Almighty. Lord, we pray for those who today may be struggling with their health or other issues and they need prayer. I pray they would do the same. Come forward and receive prayer this morning. And Lord, as we, as we study your word and as we lay these things before you, it is our desire to be men and women who, who follow you according to your spirit, who are staying in step with you. So God, move, so God, work, so God, bestow upon us everything that is necessary so that we can image forth Christ in us, the hope of glory. And we will give you all the praise and the glory for what you have done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll have some folks up front to pray with you guys. God bless you. And go in peace. <laughs>